Okay, let's see if we are streaming here. They say it's like riding a bike, but I'm not sure if that's true. I am trying to remember how to pull up the YouTube studio for when the live stream is current. I believe we're going. How do I find it? Bear with me here. If you're in the if you're in the room and you are chatting, having some conversation, just uh, talk amongst yourselves for a moment. We're hoping to have some Cardinals conversation here coming up shortly. I know that I used to be able to find the the YouTube Studio mode when I'm in here to be able to watch the broadcast as it's going. But for the moment, that has completely evaded my memory as to how to do that. Let's see, 18 watching now. Okay. I do have the chat in subscriber-only mode because that allows me to pick up a few subscribers. So if you want to chime into the chat, you can obviously do so. But just real quick, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, and that would be the easiest way for you to do so. For people who do these YouTube streams, put it in the chat, like, where should I be viewing this as I'm doing it so I can read your comments effectively? I I used to do these last year, but then I stopped, and I it's like everything... It's like completely out of my mind now. I can't remember what the heck I even did. I feel like it was something in, no, not that. Certainly wasn't that. Hopefully, let me know too in the comments because I will be able to find these comments here in a moment. Let me know that you can see me and that you can hear me. That's going to be the main thing. And then we'll try and get this thing going. A lot of good conversation to be had tonight after the Cardinals drop a tough one to the Dodgers. They were this this close to a series split and they weren't able to come up with it. If this ends up being that I can't figure out, I'm, I'm kind of a visual learner, a visual type of guy. So if I can remember just the aesthetic of what the screen looked like, it might've been a situation where I clicked the go live button from YouTube. And now I'm not, if I'm already live and I click go live, is that going to piss it off? No, this is it. I'm going to be able to find it from here. There's like, there's probably nobody left in this thing. No, there's a couple people still watching. All right. This might be able to be what I was trying to find. I was trying to find the studio. Okay. I hear myself. Um, I don't know if anybody hears me. Let me know if you can see me, hear me. Trevor, is this thing on? I'm going to sort chat by live chat. Well, oh, I could sort it by fan funding if you want to get crazy. Super chats, right? All right, I think people are able to be uh, hearing me right now. Uh, retweet this on Twitter. I um, I sat around 10.10. I think I, I almost hit that mark for starting this thing up. I'm going to retweet the tweet that I put out there and say that we're live and tell people to hop in for Cardinals Talk. I type the words I say. I don't, I don't have that function of a brain where you're able to do multiple things at once. Uh, multitasking? Yeah, not for me. All right, so let's bump this out. This is all stuff I'm I'm doing. Nobody's seeing this. Uh, make sure you like the uh, the stream, like this video on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. I love it's still in the lower right hand corner of your screen. That's awesome. That's something like these technological advances that I'm putting together are so basic, probably for most people. But for me, it's like holy crap! I was able to put the button on the screen. They can just click it. Isn't that pretty? I'm almost like a real YouTuber. Pretty great. Okay. I think I, uh, I'm i trying to tech lord here. Caffeinated, candid classroom. Well, that's nice. Yeah, I'm hoping to do more live streams, especially after road games, Cardinal fans, um, because when it's a home game, I'm usually going to be there oftentimes. Not every game, but enough um, to where it might be a little bit difficult to do a late night live. But uh, especially if the old toddler keeps sleeping good during the night, that's going to help us out here too. Hopefully, I'm, I'm seeing some stuff. The stream's current bit rate is higher than the blah, 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 blah. If it sounds good, looks good, I'm going to hopefully just take it for what it is. Let's go ahead, though, because I don't want to lose you guys. Hit like on the stream, and I'm going to start getting to... Um, I'm going to get to the comments here in a minute. I, I wanted, I'm going to start by addressing what I think is the biggest topic of conversation from the Cardinals' loss on Sunday night to the Dodgers. 
five to four in Los Angeles. And that's the John King moment. He gives up the home run to Max Muncie. And immediately I got a lot of Cardinals fans saying it's a travesty that John King's in this game. Ollie Marmol doesn't know how to manage a bullpen. That was sort of, I think, the way that, that people were feeling about that. And my thought initially was, well, it's Easter Sunday. Happy Easter, everybody, first of all. And I thought, I don't, I'm not in Los Angeles, so I'm not necessarily up to speed on everything that has been said publicly that has been reported earlier in the day. It was one of those deals where we go to multiple families' house for Easter, and so I wasn't totally locked in, but I had the game on. Um, I, I heard enough to hear Payante. That was a good one from Carl Ravitch. Um, he's really into the Brendan Donovan thing. That's nice, too. I, I heard there was an Aranoto, perhaps, was, was done to Aranoto's last name. Um, but like I said, I may not have been on top of everything, and I think it was Ben Saruti that turned me on to it after I tweeted about this topic of conversation about the bullpen usage, and I said my assumption was that you didn't have the lefties, that Libertor and Romero were going to be down today. I don't know if that had been said. Um, ben said yes, and also Helsley only available for one, I think it was. Um, there were limitations on the bullpen is what I'm trying to get to, and the move that happened earlier today was Riley O'Brien going to the injured list. They call up John King, and a lot of folks even at that point earlier in the day were saying, why John King? What about Nick Robertson? You know, why is this the bullpen move? John King didn't look too good in spring. And I think initially, when you just look at, when you make a move like that, yes, you have to make it for the days and weeks ahead because, you know, you're probably not going to call up a pitcher one day and send him down the next. Maybe you do. Maybe in this case they will. And they're just not that worried about burning uh, the, the the John King, you know, up down and just saying, hey, we'll do it. And maybe it's Robertson joining them in Los Angeles. Who knows? But I think part of the reason you do it that way is because of the lefty heavy lineup for the Dodgers. And you know you're playing them Sunday night. And you probably also know that you're down two lefties, which it did end up being the case that Libertor and Romero were down for the count today, weren't available to pitch. And so if you're saying, why, you know, why John King? Give me anybody else. My question would be like, no, who specifically do you want? And I'm not saying that as I'm judging you as a fan. I'm not saying that as you're wrong. I think it's an interesting conversation because, I, again, there are certain guys that are unavailable. And you might say, well, these games matter. you got to win them. No, I hear you. But Ali Marmel has to also make decisions in the context of talking to his players and knowing who's got what on a given night. You you don't want to necessarily betray a guy's trust and be like, yeah, you said before the game you were down and, and we weren't going to pitch you, but here you go. I'm I'm calling you in. Like there are just certain things that you got to do as a manager, and I understand that sometimes those sort of things can fly under the radar and we don't think about them as much on the exterior. But when certain guys are unavailable, certain guys are unavailable, and I so I, I think that's why John King was in there tonight. Uh, first of all, why he was on the roster to begin with, and then certainly why he comes into that spot, but. I don't particularly have a huge issue with John King coming in in that spot. It's the moves that were made either earlier in the game today or even earlier in the series. And go ahead and get your questions in, your comments in. I'm going to just give a spiel about what I feel like is one of the main topics in terms of the decision that was made. Um, I did not eat the stream. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to real quick, if we're still in here. Because there's there's a there's an advertisement thing. There's going to be some ads that come in. Hopefully, it's a seamless transition and it doesn't mess you guys up too much. Um, but that's I think that is a setting that's on. Rob, thank you for uh, responding there. I just wanted to make sure. So as Kenneth mentions right there in the in the comments, and I'm not sure how far behind the comments are in terms of when I'm seeing them, but uh, Kenneth H just put it up there, it flashed on my screen. The problem was that Ollie pulled mats too early. We had a slim bullpen, so you have to live or die with mats. That was the only thing, like in the comments I was making to y'all back and forth on Twitter, I said, this is what I want to hear from Ollie Marmel postgame. I want to know what the conversation is about Steven Matz and why you pull him after 81 pitches. Because, yes, he was getting into a little bit of trouble there in the sixth inning. He had given up a couple of doubles, but he's only at 81 pitches. You know that you're down for the count for about half of your bullpen tonight. And clearly there's the other half of the bullpen that you may not be down some guys but you're feeling like you're in a spot where you don't want to use certain guys. Like we didn't see Ryan Fernandez all weekend. I think that's kind of a central part of the conversation tonight where he doesn't get into any of these games and therefore everybody else is pinched a little bit more on what their availability sort of looks like. 
So Steven Matz, though, as a starter, was one of those guys. And the commentary did come from Ollie Marmel after the game. I want to see if I can quickly find the tweet here that I saw from Jeff Jones, who covers the, the Cardinals for Belleville News, and he's out there in Los Angeles for this series. Ollie Marmel said after the game that it was an 80-pitch cap for Steven Matz today. Palante entering the day had one inning, volunteered for more. Helsley told the coaches he was available for the ninth and would have had it with a lead. So that was a case where Helsley doesn't have, I can come in and clean up the eighth and then do the ninth. That wasn't within his bag of tricks, according to Ryan Helsley, when he had the conversation with the coaching staff. I assume that would be before the game, or maybe that's something that happens during the game as you're leading into a situation where the ninth inning could be you. So they're just trying to get through that eighth inning with a lead. They were obviously unable to do it. And you could say, well, if that's the most important spot in the game, why is Ryan Helsley not getting that spot instead of John King? Sure, you could make that argument. Who pitches the ninth, though, if the case that as we know it is that we're not going to have Ryan Helsley for it? Then it's maybe John King for the ninth. That Sometimes I think that is the best way to do it. Just work backwards, get through the situation that's the most difficult one at the moment, and then go from there. And if you're still in a position where you have a lead, be thankful that you do and, and pitch a lesser arm in the ninth and hope that you can get away with it versus there's runners on base. So, like, I could see that argument if you thought it should have been Helsley. Um, obviously, Helsley is not infallible either. Cardinals still may have lost this game. Uh, it was a case last night where Helsley comes in and did not end up getting the job done in the way that everybody had hoped, and so that's why the game goes to extra innings. But I, I think the Steven Matz thing is is answered in the way that Ollie answered it. He was on an 80-pitch cap, and I can understand there might be some frustration with that from Cardinals fans. I think the reason for that is, as we talked about on B-Shape Daily all throughout the spring, which if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do. It's a button right there in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We're doing Cardinals live streams. We're doing Cardinals podcasts and videos all season long. We've been doing them all off-season as well, but the frequency is obviously going to pick up now that we've got games going on every single day pretty much. So make sure you're subscribed. Also, if you have a Spotify account, I love getting more followers on Spotify. Just search b Shafe Daily over there. Even if you prefer listening on YouTube, if you'd follow me over there, it would be super swell if you did that. Um, I, I sound really cool saying the word swell. But the thing with Stephen Matz is we knew he was kind of behind all spring. They didn't want to really use that characterization. They kind of pushed back on it. The team, I mean, Ollie Marmel saying, I don't really like you saying behind. Eh, he's behind. It is what it is. And if you're in this first week of the season and he's got an 80 pitch cap, that is obviously the, uh, the, the that playing out in real time that he was behind what everybody else was doing in terms of their ramp up in spring. Uh, it's unfortunate that it costs you in the way that it does. But if your argument was he shouldn't have pulled Matt's as early as he did, that was my question too. And it was answered by the fact that the player had an 80 pitch cap. You can be mad about that, but that's not a decision that I think Ollie was going to, to, to veer from within the game, especially for a player who's got an injury history. The whole thing for the Cardinals and Steven Matz is keep this guy healthy. That's what they're hoping to get from him. So that part of it was not an option. You had used up everything you could from Palante. He was starting to kind of fall off the path. And then you think about the lefties you didn't have, which would be JoJo and, and Libertor. And you go to John King. I think it's why he was on the roster in the first place. Do I think he had a great spring? No. Did I think it was a confident moment to use John King? No. But I think they were kind of backed into the corner. But let's talk, and then I'll get into the comments. Why were they backed into a corner on this situation tonight in the bullpen? I think the bullpen management earlier in the series is where I would question it a little more so then moving to John King, the ghost gets into the game. Okay, it's a 5 nothing game. You're in the middle of the late innings at that point. I don't know if I, six, seventh inning, whatever it was. And I, I believe he then gave up, a, gave up a home run. It's 6 to nothing now. That's usage where I would say, man, I get it. You lost the first game of the season, and you're feeling crummy. You see the second one slipping away. But you can't necessarily just abandon your principles of the way you manage a bullpen and go to Gallegos, who's kind of one of your chief right-handed leverage relievers in a 5 nothing deficit when you do have Ryan Fernandez sitting there. And I understand maybe there's not a trust factor in Ryan Fernandez when you're facing the Dodgers, and this series has to count because all of the weight of 2023 is weighing on this team, and you just don't want to live with the, the possibility of going down that quickly and getting swept by the Dodgers. Nobody likes it, but they were down 5 nothing. If this guy's on the team, that is a, a, a moment Taylor made for Ryan Fernandez it's not that it doesn't matter. It's not that you're throwing away the game, but you have to have some level of trust in these players and put them in a position at that point to say, hey, let's see what he got. <laughs> let's see what he's got. When I get to talking fast, my grammar goes. So that would have been something that I think should have happened probably on Friday night. 
Gio gives up a home run. It's 6 nothing. It's not looking great. Somebody has to pitch those innings, but you probably go with the lower leverage guys so that the rest of the weekend against the Dodgers, you are at as full of a strength as you possibly can be. Now, another element of this is you know you have Lance Lynn going on Saturday. The expectation for him is throw your 110 pitches, big boy, and get a six or seven innings. I think in the mind of a managerial staff, that would be a moment where you would expect Lance Lynn to probably carry you a little bit more than your bullpen on Saturday. But the rain delay happens. He throws only 70 pitches. The rain delay was long enough that they weren't able to, to feel comfortable getting him back in there. I don't know if that was a case because I wasn't in L.A. I don't know if that was a case of Ali Marmel telling Lynn, look, you're good. This is going to be a long delay, so don't even kind of stay in the mindset. Or if it was just a case of any delay at that point after he had labored through the first two innings, they weren't going to stretch him beyond that. Dodgers did bring Yamamoto back out after the delay for an inning. Cardinals elected not to do so with Lynn. Uh, he did have a really efficient third and fourth, Lance Lynn did, but it, it just was the case that they weren't going to bring him back out. That also pinches your bullpen in a way that you probably don't expect when you're making those decisions to not only bring in Gallegos in that 5 nothing game on Friday, but then after the Cardinals put together a bit of a rally, it's 6-3, to three, and for the bottom of the eighth, you say, yeah, let's go Jojo Romero because we want to maybe see if we can't find our way back into this game. And I get that thought process. I don't think it's the case that they said, hey, let's go aggressive because we may not even play Saturday, so let's let's not worry about who we're using. Let's try and win this game and, and maybe set a tone early in the season after the way the first game went. Maybe you can salvage the second one and start to feel good about things. I don't necessarily think the weather played too much into that because that would just be a lot of gambling to do with uh, a place that hasn't ever had rain delays in the last nine years or whatever. By the way, how about the tarp thing last night? Absolutely hilarious for the uh, the Dodgers Browns crew staff, um, not to poke too much fun, but wow, that was funny. So I wonder, though, with those decisions, right, Gio and, and Romero in particular, I think the Gio move is a little more puzzling because Fernandez, right-hander, can maybe get you a couple of innings and and keep your bullpen better intact for Saturday, Sunday. Um, but then once you felt like you were in a three-run game, maybe that's why they say, hey, Romero, there's a lefty-heavy part of the lineup coming up. We're going to try to keep it there and maybe start a rally in the top of the ninth and win this thing. It's a long shot. It's not usually the way they plan their bullpen. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're down three. Yeah, you, you want to try and make your best run at it, but it's not likely that you're going to come back and win the game. So a little bit puzzled by that, but then you end up needing Romero on Saturday, and so now he's pitched two days in a row. Libby throws two innings on Saturday. You don't have the availability of either of those lefties against a lefty-heavy lineup, which I think leads to the John King decision over perhaps a Robertson. Again, I wasn't in L.A., so couldn't ask Ollie, couldn't ask Mo if he's there um, about those things. But that's sort of my speculation as to why that happened. But I look earlier in the series. I do. I look Friday and say, that's where you put the, the, the pinch on yourself by having those guys pitch Friday, and then suddenly you're a little bit more limited Saturday, Sunday. And Gio ended up coming in Saturday, and that was great, right? He ended up doing a great job. The man for man didn't score. Cardinals won the game in the 10th. But if he doesn't pitch on Friday, does does he have maybe an inning in him? Does he have like a Kittredge did where he could at least finish an inning and not start the next one? Like that could have been valuable in that eighth inning. If you even had a couple of outs from Gio, if you had 15 pitches from Gio, maybe you, you take a chance and you bring him into that spot in the eighth and try to get him through it. And then it's Helsley for the ninth with a lead. Like those are the things that could have happened. And I think they didn't because of the way the bullpen was managed earlier in the series, not necessarily John King. You know, why are they bringing in John King? John King's who they had in that moment. That's kind of what I think about that situation. Let me know what you think, though, Cardinals fans. I'm going to take a sip from this cup, and it is uh, it is the cup that you're thinking it is, but, I, you know, they don't pay me any money to talk about them, so I won't. But uh, take a sip, and then I'm going to get right into the comments. I see the grave of Einstein has given me some of his money to read his comments, so I'm going to do that first. Because if I don't drink water and I do an hour, an hour and a half live stream, it ends up being really bad for me the next day. Okay, Grave of Einstein, Super Chat, my man, says, I have a problem with Blake's mound visits. Unlike Maddox, he doesn't have a move like the claw. You paid for this comment, for real? <laughs> I would recommend a subtle kiss on the cheek for him. The subtle kiss on the cheek kind of feels like the, the Judas move, though, after he betrayed Jesus. It is, you know, Easter. So I don't know if that's actually what you want. It's like you go give him the kiss on the cheek, and then it's like, oh, does this mean I'm about to get taken out of the game? What's going on here? I think actually in the Bible, biblically, that might have been a kiss on the lips. But nevertheless, um, thank you for the uh, for the super chat. Um, I didn't know what the comment was going to be when I started reading it, and then I started talking it out loud, and I was like, oh, okay, you're the same as you ever were. Appreciate you. Um, 
let's go ahead and put a like on this video. The fact that, that we're only on 30 likes has me really just feeling down about myself. All right, I'm going to scroll back to the top of the comments. I figure you guys are going to touch on a lot of the things that I would want to talk about anyway, but I was just basically going to say, hey, give me one topic to riff on. It's the topic everybody wants to know about. Um, if you have more questions about the bullpen stuff specifically, I'll get into them as we go. Uh, but I, I think I just wanted to kind of say, hey, this is what I'm, I'm thinking about that as we get going here in the beginning and then sort of go from there. Um, live chat, I'm going to be bumming if I can't get all the way back to the top. Sometimes I just can't, you know. It's just you guys are chatting so much, I can't maybe get to all of it. Brent has the first one in the chat that I can actually look at and see. So I'm going to read from there on. Um, and the super chats, I'll absolutely try to get to. I want to get to everybody's chats, but the super chats, they make literally like bold different colors, so it's easier for me to see. Brent says, I know it's early, but it feels like the energy is really low with the team. Also, the at-bats are bad. Yeah, so let's talk about the lineup a little bit. We talked about the, the the pitching. Really, the relief pitching is what we talked about, and it was more from a managerial standpoint in terms of the decisions. Um, Mats did look pretty good. Lance Lynn did his job yesterday. It was just truncated because of the rain. Um, Palante had a great first inning. Payante, real good stuff from him. And then it wasn't so good. The second inning, it's, you know, he volunteered for more. That was the word from Ollie after the game. And it, it obviously didn't go well. You'd like to only have to use these guys for one inning, but sometimes you get into the, the, the grind and the spot that they were in tonight, and it didn't end up working out that Palante was was still juicy for that second inning. But the at-bats in particular, yeah, they don't look great right now. And I think a lot of guys look just off at the plate. Um, like, I know there's been a lot of conversation before tonight about how Victor Scott looked overmatched, and I disagreed with that. I said, look, I think he's taken some good at-bats. Yes, he's got like five strikeouts and 10 at-bats, but yesterday he he basically hard line out or fly out to center and then to right and then to left. It just didn't count because of the whole not obstruction actually was a balk ordeal. And then it was kind of like a weak pop out to end his actual at bat there. But I thought, hey, Victor Scott's actually putting some good swings on the ball. I think he's hanging in there. That was the way I was phrasing it yesterday. He's hanging in there, and that's all I could ask for a rookie that has never played AAA, just trying to, to get his bearings and play a good center field and also be a complete menace on the bases, which he continues to be. If that was in a winning effort tonight, we'd only be talking about Victor Scott and how he had such a great impact on the game. And uh, ultimately, you know, we're talking about something different, I realize. Please like the video. I know we're up to 40, but I know we can get to 50. Uh, but on Victor, it was like, man, he's taking these at-bats. I think he's looking really good. Two for three tonight, also reached base via walk. That's what you want to see. I would bat him ninth personally because I. it's not that Mason's not having a good start. He's hitting 333, better than most on the team. Might be better than everybody on the team. But typically, I would want to have my my big guns. If if Mason win, or pardon me, if Victor Scott's on base, I want to have the big guns behind him have a chance to drive him in. But those big guns aren't really doing much right now anyway. Donovan off to a slow start. Had the RBI double yesterday. Um, had, had RBIs today as well with the hit that he did have. But in the other at-bats, he's I, I don't know how many it's been, five or six, but the strikeout looking has been a real bugaboo for Brendan Donovan so far, and it's just like he's not seeing the ball well. He doesn't look comfortable in the box. Like it's, I think visually it's pretty evident that he's not quite where he wants to be, but that's one series, four games. Hopefully he comes through it. I think he's going to have to be a big part for the Cardinals in terms of table setting this season. So Donovan doesn't look great. Goldie, you know, has had some good moments, but when he's not doing damage, he's striking out. Gorman, rough with the golden sombrero today. Did have a base hit, but uh, yeah, the at-bat's not good. In terms of the, it's just those those pitches below the zone that you're chasing and you're missing on. The, the, the plate discipline has not been great. You had the 14K game against Bobby Miller earlier in the series, and tonight I can check the box score to get you the number. It was 13 strikeouts. Um, yeah, it just doesn't look super-duper disciplined to me. Arenado does not look good. Everybody's kind of been commenting on that. No, he looks bad. But I, I think that's sort of been sort of the M.O. that he's had throughout his career to, to be a slow starter. You'd hate to see that because you, you do know that this season matters and the, these games matter early in April, especially when you're playing against uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes over there in Los Angeles. But hopefully Arenado will come around. There's been a couple of swings that look better than others. I think he got robbed last night when they called it an error on Muncie at third instead of a base hit. I thought it was a hit. I mean, he hit it like 101 off the bat. I looked it up on StatCast uh, during the podcast. I don't know what the deal was with that. But, yeah, he's hitting 063. He didn't strike out tonight, so that's good. But Wilson's got plenty of strikeouts and, and, and no batting average, basically. Um, Burley, another Walker has kind of struggled. It was good to see Walker draw a walk tonight, uh, but he's really struggled early on. And, uh, you know, Mason Wynn's got the batting average, but no power. So, yeah, up and down the lineup, not a lot of production. And I would say that's sort of been backed by the level of ABs that we're seeing. Not a super high quality at bat necessarily from a lot of the guys right now. 
Hopefully, it's just a case of being early. But as I will continue to reiterate, the way this Cardinal team is constructed, you have the starting rotation that I think is is kind of middle of the pack. Whether they're 15th in baseball or 20th in baseball or whatever ends up being, I think they're sort of in that range. I don't think it's a top 10 rotation at the end of the day. They could push to be top 13, top 15, and kind of you know be solid, and that's assuming health, which is a, a tough assumption right now with your ace on the IL. But that's kind of where I figure them. They're middle of the pack. Bullpen, I think, especially with how many injuries they're enduring, is going to be kind of middle of the pack. I thought before the year that maybe you could say it could be a top 10, top 12 bullpen. I guess it still can be. Not much has changed in the, the few days you've had other than the bullpen's gotten beat up a little bit because they played the Dodgers. But even if, it's a, if it is a top 10, top 12 bullpen, that's not enough to really get the team where it wants to be unless the offense is elite. And by elite, I mean top 10 almost has to be the, the prerequisite. You might need to have a top eight, top six lineup, maybe top five lineup in terms of OPS run scored. Right now, this lineup doesn't look anything close to that. And so that would be an early concern for me. They can turn it around because I look on paper and I say, hey, I like the names of the players that are in your lineup. But if those guys aren't performing, and I mean they're they're really not performing right now as a, a consistent group, then I think that is going to be a question. But it's been that way for the last number of years. doesn't matter who the hitting coach has been either. The Cardinals, in terms of consistency, game to game, you have games where it's great, and then you have games where it's really not so great. And that consistency, I think, is going to be important to kind of harness this year, but we haven't really seen it to this point. Granted, four games. Like, this should have been a win. We should be talking about how the Cardinals grabbed a, a split of this series and are 2-2, two and two, and the, the Dodgers with the bajillion-dollar payroll are 2-2, two and two, and it's a bullpen thing that happens at the end of the game where you blow it, but that's going to be the way that this team is built. They're going to play a lot of the 5-4 games, and you have to be on the right side of them instead of blowing them late when, you know, and there's always going to be a reason. Well, the bullpen was down and we didn't have this guy. And so there's reasons. You can call them excuses. I think they're explanations and I think it matters to have them. But it, it's just going to eventually, if they continue, add up to be, hey, here's the team you are and it's not the team you want to be. That's not a situation I think the Cardinals want to be in. And so that would be my concern with the offense early. And of course, I did a Brendan and I talked for eight minutes about one comment. And so now I haven't gotten to the rest of them. I'll do that now. Okay, uh, Einstein would have been nice to have Keenan Middleton that inning. Yep, sure would have. Like, you're dealing with injuries. Riley, you know, I was excited to see him, and now we may not for a while, you know. And and Middleton's another guy that I think is going to help this bullpen, but not when he's on the IL. That's an unfortunate start. Appreciate you guys for watching. Click like on the video so more people on YouTube see it. That would be appreciated. The subscribe button is literally impossible to miss, bottom right of your screen. So thank you, guys. Uh, Justin says the Cardinals not very good at the uh, at the plate. 43 strikeouts in four games. Yep, the discipline's been a problem. That's sort of what I was touching on, and I agree with you there, Justin. Uh, Rich said tough loss today, but I'm not bummed yet. It's a long season. Yeah, are, are you still kind of in the mode of just glad baseball's back? That's kind of where I am. And look, I know I, I have a bit of a different perspective than folks on these streams where you guys might be living and dying with the Cardinals. I used to be that way as a kid, and then I got this job, and I cover the team now, and it's not the same I, I'm not a you know, I'm not a fan anymore, but I, I really do sort of you, you live and die with like what's going on with this team because I know the next day we're going to be talking about it endlessly, whether it's Twitter, whether it's my radio shows, whether it's writing articles like this is what we do all summer. And so I'm still kind of in the mode of like this stuff is back, which is really still a, a pretty good thrill to me. Um, but yeah, it would have been a lot nicer to be talking about a two and two team because then you can kind of oh, you exhale, right? The, the 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 worries of Thursday and Friday would be behind you. Thursday was ugly, man, and you lose Friday as well in, in not a super-duper competitive way. It kind of made it a little bit closer at the end, but it wasn't great. And then you would have been able to just say, yeah, doesn't matter. You're 2-2. Two and two. So are they. That's why today would have been really nice to get, and they didn't get it. Um, Einstein wondering uh, why put Kittredge in that early. I think I saw somewhere, and again, I think that might have been a the, the, the Ben Cerruti, who is on Twitter, replied to me that he had mentioned it was – something reported earlier in the day, I think, that he had maybe like an inning at most. And so they he's one of their better relievers. And so if he's in that spot, you're saying, well, let's put him in because we're trying to get through this jam after Matt's had the situation that he had. And so you could go to somebody else in that spot in the sixth. But if you do, who are you going to? And how confident are you in that individual, um, you know, being able to get the job done? I was trying to look up this damn tweet and I can't find it. So I'm going to give up. But I'm pretty sure that's what he said. And I took his word for it because I didn't have time to do any different. Um, so, yeah, I just think Kittredge, like, you're, yes, it's early. It's only the sixth. When you have a pitcher 
on a pitch count of 80 and he's pitching good enough to be pitching that next inning or two and he can't because of the pitch count thing, that ends up being just kind of a complicating factor and you got to figure out ways to deal with that. And it's usually throwing your best arms earlier than you otherwise would and hoping you can coast to the finish. Tonight, they were not able to do that decidedly. I'm not saying that there were errors made or not made, but that's kind of what ends up happening a lot of the time when you're getting yourselves into those situations um, outside circumstances. Sometimes you create those circumstances on a Friday when you're you're pitching quality pitchers, some of your top leverage guys in a game that you're not going to win. And so that, to me, if you're going to criticize Ollie, that would be where I would do it. I would say, I think earlier in the series, he didn't set himself up for success. And yes, you got screwed when Saturday ended up being a rain delay and your guy who could probably throw 120 pitches if you asked him to, he only gets to throw 70. The circumstances of that help to create the situation that follows. Helsley blowing the save also ensures that you need Geo in that spot on Saturday, and he does a great job, and you get that win. It was important that you did, but now you don't have Geo on Sunday um, because he pitched on, on Friday and he pitched on Saturday. Like, didn't need to pitch Friday. Hope you would have liked for him not to have to pitch Saturday, but you weren't able to hold the save, and so you did. Like, those things compound. It doesn't happen in a vacuum to Ollie Marmel as a manager. And I think tonight is such a great example of that, whereas, like, last year people were so mad, and I, you're, you're mad now, and I totally get it. But I feel like this is pretty cut and dry as to why it's like, be mad at Ollie if you want. Here are the things that happened. Be mad at him for the right thing if you're going to be mad. That would be, and I'm not going to tell you, that's not me telling you how to fan. I think it just makes you kind of more informed in the criticism, which can also be valuable because I'm not saying it's not there to be criticized. I think there are elements of this to critique. Um, that ends up being, you know, kind of the interpretation that a lot of times fans just look at the thing and go, John King stinks. Why they, why they pitch him? Damn it. I dropped my pen. I got another one. It's fine. I like to hold a pen when I talk. So that's kind of what I look at that as, um, Kitchers threw a lot of balls. I did not eat the stream, Eric. Hopefully it's still going and everything's going well. Um, Rob says two of the four losses have seen Goldie or not Gorman take the plate in the ninth and they haven't scored a run or record an extra base hit. Yep. So like it's, it's the pitching thing. It's the bullpen thing. It's the, the lineup has just not looked good. The ABs have not been good. The strikeouts, the, the non-competitive, you know, when, when you're chasing, I hate that. And when you're letting those pitches in the zone go by for strike three or for maybe it's not strike three. Like I think it was yesterday when they, we had a chance to add on, it was Carpenter. And people said, oh, you should pinch it for Carpenter. We did a whole thing about that last night on B-Shape Daily. If you missed it, go back on the YouTube channel. Um, it's probably the most recent video, not live stream, because that's categorized uh, separately. But talked about, like, Carpenter had 84 down the pipe, and that would have been the pitch to swing at, but he's kind of sitting on that first pitch instead of, you know, being ready to go and maybe being able to do damage on 84 down the, I mean, middle, middle. If you're playing MLB The Show, you wouldn't have even had to have moved your cursor. What do they call that? The uh, the A. A -T API API. I got to get the show, but I don't have a PS five. So um, we'll, we'll have to do more YouTube videos, make some more money. Um, Kenneth says the problem was that Ollie pulled Matt's. Okay. So we talked about that. Mike says that the silver lining is that Matt's pitch. Well, that is a silver lining. Hopefully next time you have him for more like a hundred pitches and he can go an extra inning. And then we're not talking about John King. That would be nice. Uh, everybody's saying the stream is good. Like that's the comments I'm getting to now. Trevor, the problem was the rain. Lynn losing two innings of work was the difference in the game today. That compounded by the fact that you used Geo on Friday when you maybe didn't need to. I understand it, but what, I mean, Ryan Fernandez did not pitch in the series, and you had several games, at least two, the first two, where you had large deficits that you were dealing with. I Find a moment to get him in there. I know it's not ideal, but that's probably the managerial mistake that Ollie made. I don't know. There may have been others, but that was primarily what I would look at and say, yeah, that's probably where you lose me a little bit. And uh, you could have benefited from putting him in to eat some of those innings. Have him have him eat a couple of innings. He's a Rule 5 guy. I get it. He's got to be on the roster. If you don't trust him, what better time to find out whether you should or not in other leveragey kind of situations by throwing him out there for multiple innings and just seeing what happens. You know, that's probably what should have happened at some point uh, Friday. And then I'd have to go back Thursday to see exactly who pitched when. But that's sort of my thought process there. Um, Brian thinks that Matt's is fragile, was getting into some big trouble. Don't have a heartache with it. Yeah, and, like, he was on a pitch count. It, the prescription was 80, and he threw 81. It's it's more than just, like, oh, Matt's is kind of a fragile guy, and, and the wheels could fall off quickly. No, I don't really think it's that. I think they literally had 80 for him, and that was it. Ollie said, uh, Ollie would say he's still getting stretched out. That's from John. Um, John Wick. I don't know if that's really John Wick. If it is, hey, what's up? Um, so, yeah, I, he is still kind of getting stretched out. But as Justin mentioned uh, as well, Matt's pitched good. Uh, Matt's probably going longer his next time out. I agree with Eric on that. 
Um, Rob mentioning the conversation of Helsley needing to be the solidified closer needs to be discussed. He should be there to put, uh, put out fires. Yep. I think the eighth would have been a moment to use Helsley. If you were going to, if you're saying he was available for the ninth, I would say the ninth doesn't matter or happen. Like if it, it, it doesn't happen. It didn't happen. The Dodgers didn't bat in the ninth because you gave up the lead. So what would you have done if they score a run, you give up the lead, but it's tied and now you still have to pitch the ninth. Then you blow or, or you burn Ryan Helsley and you maybe still don't even win the game because it's a tie game in the ninth. Like, I think probably if you had him, I would have preferred to see Helsley in the eighth. Knowing that you had him for an inning, that would be another way I, I think you could critique the Ollie moves tonight and say, yeah, he was available for the ninth. I get it. You're on the road. You don't want to use your closer. I, th- I think you just go ahead and use him in the eighth. If that's all you have him for, that's all you have him for. And people can critique you for that and be upset about that. But I think that's the way I would have gone about it because you don't end up having the ninth inning. You didn't have it because you lost the game by then. That's the unfortunate part. Brendan says, Fernandez not showing up in the series is my only real question for the series. I didn't think it was managed bad, but still can't understand why Fernandez wasn't used. Clearly not trusted by the manager at this point, but the only way the guy can gain trust is by getting an opportunity in a downside of a game like Friday. And they went Geo, and Geo gave up a bomb anyway. So that, I think, is where, again, these are minutia. It's little decisions that can end up costing you later. And I think in this case, by not using Fernandez on Friday, um, and then by going to JoJo, right? Like, if you had used Fernando for uh, Fernandez instead of Gio on Friday, maybe he gives up two runs, but then you go, well, screw it. Just eat the second inning, too. And then maybe you have both Gio and JoJo available tonight because they both pitch Saturday, but they're both fresh enough to go Sunday. And then it's a different game tonight. That's those little minutia details that I think can get lost. But, but it had an impact on tonight's game, if you ask my opinion. Trevor mentioning that Gio is the fireman in that bullpen. And he was just down today. Yeah, I think Kittredge can be a fireman type. I think Keenan, if you had him, would be healthy uh, could, to be a fireman type. But you got to have multiple of them, and, and maybe the best one would be Geo. And you didn't have him. That I think you didn't have him because he pitched Friday instead. And Friday, I, you, you ask a Cardinal fan in, in retrospect, which is easy to do hindsight. But would you rather have had Geo tonight for that spot or the one that he pitched in on Friday that was meaningless and he didn't succeed in it anyway? I, I don't think there's any any question as to how you'd answer that. Um, Justin also mentioning the 43 strikeouts. Not great. WSC. I've been a hardcore Cardinal fan for over 40 years. And I can honestly say that the last two years have broken my heart. You hate to see that. Not because we're losing, but because the front office just doesn't seem to care. Yeah. There's a perception of that from, from this front office. And look, I think last year they didn't do Cardinals fans a very good justice by like not only having a bad team, but being kind of unwilling to talk about it publicly and, you know, not having the level of, of, general media availability that John Mozeliak historically had had because typically you have the first game of a homestand Mo is typically having a scrum which doesn't mean anything to people who are are not like in the media like for us it's, it's like good access that you don't have to like ask for it's just kind of going to be the understood thing that it happens often that didn't really happen hardly at all last year in the second half and you know Mo kind of would push back on that you'd hear him a little bit snarky in a radio interview and say well I was available I was you know I talked to so and so I had yeah, and private interviews that are set up, and that's fine. And that th- those those relationships with Mo and the people that have them set those up, that's valuable and it's important coverage. Um, but just typically, you would have the, the 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 availability more often than I think you did last year, which I think in a year like that, it's almost more important to show your face and just have that. It doesn't mean all that much. And I think maybe unless you're a hardcore Cardinal fan, you don't notice something like that very much. But, like, the, hard, the hardcore fans are the ones that comment on Twitter and that watch a freaking live stream of, from some bozo like me that is talking about their favorite team. Like, it's y'all that are the hardcore fans. And I feel like they kind of did you guys a disservice last year by not having a little bit more of that, hey, it'll be some tweets that you read on Twitter and you'll see Mo's face from, from a beat writer that you follow. But, like, that's something. It's like, hey, we hear that fans are frustrated and we're at least kind of taking the heat and we're willing to take some questions and talk about it. And then they, of course, didn't have the end-of-season press conference. Just flat-out didn't have one. Kind of lied because they said, oh, we're going to have it later on. There's no news to report right now, which is not the point of those end-of-season pressers. That's not why you do them, is to talk about the news for next year, especially after a 91 loss season. It's just to kind of take your medicine, and I think they should have done that. It's not the end-all, be-all. It's not a big deal. It doesn't change how many games they win on the field, but I think it's just an organizational practice that would have been um, beneficial. And then you have things like the offseason where, oh, Moselec said he didn't really think about it when, it when he was asked about injuries at uh, winter meetings in Nashville. Are there any injuries to report or any you know updates on anything that 
that we don't already know, like throw us a bone. And then it's, no, there's not really anything. And then a week, you know, month later, Tommy Edmond, oh, yeah, he had surgery in October. Oops, we forgot. But he's going to be fine in spring. But also, no, he's not because then he wasn't. Like, it's just kind of stuff like that that I do think grates on Cardinals fans. And it does. it's not to say that they think you're stupid. That would be a little bit of a harsh way to phrase it. But I think it's a little bit disrespectful to the fan base to sort of have that be the way things go sometimes. I think John Mosaic does a really good job in a lot of areas, but I think it has been, there have been some missteps over the past year of how to deal with maybe the struggles of a season like the one that they had, where, you know, I can understand where fans might wish that they would have seen some different things from the team. Um, and that's kind of my whole response because WSC mentioned that it just, you know, broke his heart to see the, the way that's gone the last couple of years because it seems like not only are they losing, but the front office just doesn't seem to maybe have that sense of urgency or that sense of care or sort of even respect for the fan base to say, like, here's... And again, I don't know if that's entirely fair because do I think John Mozeliak respects Cardinals fans? I do think that. But I think there there could have maybe been some more effective ways of showing that during times where it's been uh, kind of lean, obviously, with the losing that is going on. Again, does this impact things on the field? No, but I do think they're organizationally some things that could be valuable to maybe handle differently at times. Uh, Eric says that Fernandez could have been used Thursday or Friday, Thursday, Thursday most of all. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I, I'm not going to go right back now in the middle of the stream and look at the game log from Thursday to, to remember exactly who pitched when and tell you when he should have pitched. But I think between Thursday and Friday, they could have found a spot for uh, for Ryan Hernandez. Uh, Fernandez, pardon me. Um, 55 likes. I bet we can get to 60. Appreciate you guys for watching for sure. Um, subscribe. It's right there on the screen, as I mentioned, nice and red, and it says subscribe. And it's a little button, so you can click it. Um, how would you feel, asks the grave of Einstein, if King didn't blow it and you saw a tired Helsley with already diminished stuff come out for the ninth, though? Um, I, you, I would have said, I know the situation in this bullpen, and Helsley is the only option right now because they used up the, the other guys that probably shouldn't have pitched Friday. Because if Gio and uh, what's his bucket, JoJo don't pitch Friday, then you probably could choose either of them to pitch in that moment. You you, you have JoJo pitch in the eighth and Gio gets the ninth. That would have been very easy to do. Or Helsley gets the ninth. If he had an inning in him, like he's he's who you want. So I think that's probably, like I would have felt great about it. Um, now, would it have worked out? There's no really, there's no real way to know for sure about that. I don't know about diminish. Like I think Helsley, you know, Pitch last night, threw a lot of pitches, didn't go great, but he had an inning in him, and so I think it would have been okay to to have seen that play out. So I don't know. I don't I don't really think I, I have a huge issue with that if it's Helsley coming out, but it's also like it could have been somebody else if you hadn't burned up the, the arms that you did on Friday. Now, I also want to recognize that like, if you choose Fernandez and he doesn't go the rest of the game, doesn't go those multiple innings, then probably one of JoJo or Gio still gets used. But use Fernandez first, and maybe it goes well. He can be efficient enough to just eat those innings and allow for you to have the ability to reserve your best arms for Saturday and Sunday. And by the way, like it's not over. The Cardinals go to San Diego and they play a game tomorrow. There's still no off day until after the home opener on Thursday. So like this problem is not necessarily over, but I do think the Cardinals gained a lot tonight by the fact that they had the, the guys that they arrested who should all basically be back available for tomorrow. Um, Guppy says losing Thompson in the bullpen also hurt, especially when you need a guy to go multiple innings like today. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that, but he's in the rotation and, uh, you know, had the, the three home run balls that he gave up, but otherwise had some good things cooking. I'm anxious to see his next start to see what that looks like because I think he can build upon what he did and then maybe have you feeling a little bit better about the rotation depth if Thompson's able to thrive in the next one. Uh, keep commenting, guys. I'm, I'm slowly working my way through the comments. Hopefully YouTube doesn't do the time warp where I get jumped because I'm so far behind, but I'm trying to, 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 to run through these as quick as I can. Uh, I appreciate you guys for watching, of course. Kenneth says, so Ollie was limiting the pitch count because it was his first start of the season. I understand if it was a pitch cap, but it, if he's doing good, up by three runs, you threw away the plane and let him cook. It wasn't because it was the first start of the season. I think it was basically like his pitch count was akin to what his last start in spring should have been, but he was behind because it took him a little bit longer to ramp up. So I don't think it makes sense, Kenneth. I, I understand the point. I don't think you're going to throw out the game plan at that point, though, because it was it's more of a health thing. Like, they're trying to keep him healthy, and that's why they brought him along more slowly. And in the grand scheme of the season, they figured, eh, if he has one fewer inning in his first start of the year in the fourth game of the season, not going to be a longstanding issue. Tonight, though, it may have cost him. But granted, he gave up two doubles in that sixth. Like, he might finish the sixth inning and, and do so in a way that you're not le uh, leading in the game anymore. So that certainly is a possibility that could have happened. Um, 
So I hear you, though, but I don't think you you throw away that plan in the middle of it. Uh, the Dodgers own the Cardinals, says Wu Nords. Um, they did this weekend, that's for sure. Trevor says a topic that I think isn't getting enough love. Carp should have taken Gorman's at bat with the bases juiced. Pitcher was rattled and disciplined hitter could have put forth a better A-B. Um, those kind of decisions are tough. I think you don't want to take the bat out of Gorman's hands probably because you're just, he's always one at bat uh, away from sort of breaking out of the slump that he's in. But yeah, instead you're striking out for the fourth time. Um, can understand the point there that that was maybe a little bit disappointing, but you also have to think about defensively. Like you're going to plug, uh, are you going to plug him into second base? I, I guess it was Gorman at second base, right? So I, I don't necessarily know that that's the answer, but I, I understand. Like, I think it's getting a little bit too cute if you're talking about doing something like that, but I hear you. Uh, Ethan says, my issue is that we don't use Fernandez early in the series, save arms and bad losses, 100%. That's exactly what we've been talking about, too. So uh, you're you're on the right track, in my opinion, Ethan. If we have a burnt-out bullpen four games into the season, bad look, terrible management of the roster in the bullpen. Yes, in part, and we talked about the mistakes that I do think were made earlier on Thursday and Friday, but also you have had some, some bum luck with injuries. But other teams have that, too, and they find a way to win games, or they don't. And if they don't, they're a losing team, and then we view them as such. So... You, those this is going to be the summer of no excuses. Like we'll talk about it and say, yep, injuries had happened and have made it harder. And the, the rain delay made it harder. And all these things are true, but you're the team that you are and you got to own what you are. And so you're one in three right now, regardless of what the luck has been. Like nobody wants to hear John Mosella come out this year and go, well, we didn't have a great year because of injury. Nope. That's wrong. You got to know that injuries happen to every team every summer. You have to plan ahead for those. And if you, if you, don't and you lose games and you say, well, it was injuries. You didn't plan ahead well enough. You didn't prepare for the knowledge that injuries were going to be an inevitability. Phillips says starters will have to get deeper into games. We're in the same situation as last year's starters go short. BP has to call uh bullpen has to cover. And then there's no one to pitch late in games. Yeah. It, this series felt very 2023 in a lot of ways. Um, I would say credit to the team for winning the game on Saturday, the way they did. Uh, maybe the, the, the Cardinals of, of 2023 don't, Battle back, but they had some battle back wins last year too. So I I don't even know if I would agree with that sentiment. I think this was very much a 2023 series, which should put a little bit of fear into people, but it is early. But I won't be saying it's early for nearly as long as I did last year. That was a, a good full month and a half. And then I was like, all right, actually, <laughs> this is bad. Um, it may not be early. Noah says screw Max Muncie. Well, he's a good player. He was maximum Muncie tonight. Turned it to full Muncie. Um they say never go full Muncie, but when he does, it usually works out for the Dodgers. Wu Nord seems to be a Dodgers fan. Let's go Dodgers, and Matt's Muncie is the Cards' dad. So there you have it. Um, WSC disagreeing with Trevor's idea to go Carp over Gorman. We already kind of touched on that. Hello, Allison. Good to see you commenting. I missed you. Um, is this year going to be all about pitching again? I thought we went out and fixed the problem. I don't want to spend the whole season talking about pitching. I think we're going to talk a lot about pitching, Allison. It might be good at times. Like, you look at the starting pitching. Matt's five and five and change, gave up a couple of runs. You take that. Lynn, scoreless appearance yesterday. It would have been longer and lengthier if not for the rain delay. So, I kind of give the Cardinals a pass on that a little bit. Um, Michaelis has to be better. Thompson has to be better. He pitched decently, but when you give up three bad pitches and they hit homers on him, and it's not to say he didn't make other bad pitches, too. Like, it's easy to say, oh, those are my three mistakes because they went for homers. There were some other pitches, I'm sure, that you probably go, eh, you got away with it that time. You can't throw too many of those pitches, not against the Dodgers. So, you know, we'll see. And Sonny Gray is going to be a boon to the rotation when he comes back, which should be within, you know, the next 10 days or so. April 9th, I think he's eligible, so I expect him right thereafter to be to be starting. Uh, GB Gunther says, should I let Lynn go after the delay? Dodgers even let their $300 million man keep going. Yeah, I do wonder about that. If I were in L.A., I would have would have asked, and I maybe it was asked and covered, and I didn't happen to see it. But I kind of thought that, too. Like, yeah, you could, of all guys, you could probably let him go. Was it a case where Ollie told him right away, like, basically, hey, you're good, just you're, you're, you're out for the night because, you know, maybe they didn't think they were going to restart very soon. And then when they did, it was like, Oh, okay, I guess, you know, we already told you you're good. Other than that, it is a little bit puzzling. But again, you don't want to risk anything with anybody this early. So I can see both sides. Guppy says a lot of pitch sequences were not very good. Bad placement on a lot of guys. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Nick asking if uh, Arenado is broken. I don't think he's broken, but it doesn't look good. We talked about that within the context of the whole lineup. Not really looking great. Um, Woodard says he shouldn't have signed Lance Lynn. I don't really think that's true. He looked good yesterday. Two stop Dodgers might be fraud struggled versus the lowly Cardinals. Victor Scott is a bright spot. Um, yeah, he, 
I, I talked a little bit earlier in the stream about Victor Scott. I think he looks great, um, exciting. Has he struck out some? Sure. Why would I pick on Victor Scott for his strikeouts when all the other guys are striking out too, and he's actually doing some interesting things when he does get on base? Um, I love what I'm seeing from Victor Scott, despite the low batting average to this point. Today was, a, I mean, 100-plus exit below on the double. Um, he's going to be a problem on the bases every time. I want to see Victor Scott stay. I don't I, look. He could could he use some seasoning offensively at AAA. Perhaps he's the kind of guy to me, mentality wise, that can probably figure out a way to work through it at this level. Um, when you get Newt Bar and Carlson and Edmund back, it's going to be a tight squeeze, and maybe he does go back down. But for now, I think it's invaluable, and I hope he continues to push the envelope um, defensively. Is the key. Like if they if if Victor Scott's doing enough offensively, not great, but just fine. But then they have all these injured guys come back healthy, and they send him out. And then somebody else takes over center, and it doesn't look like it looks when Victor's out there. I am going to be talking about that because I think that's almost more important than any of, of the other elements. Is like, and I get it; it's hard to say that when the lineup is not cooking. But Victor can be an element that begins the cook for the lineup. He can help uh, be the kindling at times. But defensively, I really trust what he can do as well. Even when he's not making like looking good on every play, he took a, a false step back last night and then had to run in. I think it was last night earlier in the series. Had to run in and make a diving catch. He has the athleticism to make up for the mistakes, but I think he also is going to continue to get better on instinct and jumps and things like that. So for me, it's just I, I really want to see him continue to get opportunities. I think for now he will because those injured guys are still a little bit away. Um, but when the first one comes back, what will the decision be? To me, it's easy. It's it's probably Michael Ciani going rather than Victor. I want to see him for kind of as long as I can because right now I like what I'm seeing. Craig says we missed Newton Edmond, but the cards still held their own while missing some key guys, uh, bullpen guys too. This team is close from batting talent, power, speed. It's all there. They'll find their rhythm. Yeah, it's just disappointing to see offensively because I think that's the element that we have said, at least I have said all offseason, needs to end up carrying this team. And so if it doesn't, which it isn't right now, you know, what's the concern level there? I think that would be the the only thing from this one, Craig. But you're right. Like the the names on the on the lineup card, you go, yeah, these are guys you trust. These are guys you like shouldn't be too worried about what the offense would look like, but you've seen four games and there are some troubling things on the plate discipline that they're hopefully going to be able to work through eh, in short order. Uh, Brian, every year is all about pitching <laughs> telling Allison. Yeah, it is. The thing is with the staff they've gotten, the bats really have to step up because the starters are going to give up runs. I think that's how they're built. Brian, I completely agree. I've been saying it on B shape daily all off season. Speaking of which, uh, B shape daily, it's this podcast that I do. It's on this YouTube channel. And uh, if you click subscribe in the lower right hand corner of your screen, you'll be able to see uh, and subscribe to it. That'd be great. We're on Spotify and Apple too. Just throwing a quick plug in there. Um, Victor Scott played well. Gorman and Nolan are stealing money, uh, according to Two Stop. Um, well, Gorman's not getting paid all that much, but Nolan, you know, he's getting he's getting a handsome salary. I think he'll turn out to be okay. It wasn't a great series for Arenado though. Um, I think he's pressing a little bit. He wants to win, and and he can feel that he's probably not at his best right now, and that's something that I think does impact him. Aaron says K's on offense seem like the bigger problem than the bullpen management in this series. And I couldn't agree more. I talk about the bullpen management off the top because it just happened tonight. And it was something that I knew that everybody was talking about. I had takes on it. I thought, nah, don't complain about John King unless you tell me who else you're going to bring in. And then I sort of guide people to say, look, I think it was what happened Friday and earlier in the series. The not, the not use the uh, the unwillingness to use Ryan Fernandez. See, if I were recording this podcast, I'd be like, what's a not use? Shut up, you moron. And I pause it and I start over on that line. But this is live. And so, uh, you know, we get better as broadcasters by doing these things. Uh, but I agree with the commentary. I just think it's, I, I think the, the, the offense is going to be the thing that has to carry the Cardinals. Bullpen management is typically overblown because people want something to be mad about. And so they, they lash out at the thing that's kind of low-hanging fruit, to use a, a, a phrase there. Speaking of which, you got to tell Charlie Marlowe to stop ducking me. We're supposed to get on and do some podcasts this week. I'm sure it'll get going. He's busy. Don't tell him that. I mean, you could, but as long as he knows, it's just teasing. Um, if you enjoy that, too. Charlie has his YouTube channel, successful, doing a lot of great stuff over there. Um, and him and I have been doing a Cardinal podcast that we'll keep doing on his channel. So subscribe to Charlie, too, if you don't already. You probably do. He's got way more subs than I do. Um, let's see. Where were we? Kenneth, I agree Fernandez should have been the mop-up reliever. Not an insult. It's a necessary role to keep the great relievers fresh and not waste their innings. Yep, and then what happens is guys who start out as mop-ups, which if you're a Rule 5 guy, it's not a slight on your character or your ability to say, yeah, you're kind of in that mop-up role. 
that's you got to start somewhere. And so if he pitches well, it's like, wait a minute, this guy's got the juice. We're going to use him in different spots. You got to let him pitch. You know, if he's not trusted by the manager, why is he on the roster? Well, he's rule five, so he has to be if he's in the org. So that's something they got to they got to circle the wagons on that and figure out what's the role going to be and and pull the trigger when it's time to use him. There's everybody's got to have a role. You can't play with a seven man bullpen. I think at times they did a little bit too much of that last year where that last guy wasn't maybe trusted enough. And you just got to recognize, like, last guy might not be a great pitcher, but you got to use him or they'll find somebody else. But if you don't use him, you're not going to really be able to do that uh, that recon to know kind of what he is. No power for Arenado, one for 16. Mariposa edits. Um, yep, been rough. WSC says, uh, I love how most of you fire Cheeto eating, <laughs> bang drinking armchair managers think you can do better. Um, that made me laugh. That's funny. Um, trade Nolan and Goldie. Tank for draft picks. Victor Scott is amazing. I think it's a little early to be tanking. But, guys, I've said it on B-Shape Daily. I don't know how many of y'all are regular listeners, but um, if, this, if this season is going down the tubes by July, Goldie probably will be traded, and Arenado will be right behind him in November um, at the latest. That is my opinion. And I think there will be changes in the front office. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this tonight, but I think there is a doomsday scenario that's been sort of almost baked into the way they built the roster this year, that they could cut 85 to $90 million in payroll like this for 2025 and basically still feel the roster that has enough interesting pieces that y'all are still going to go to games. <laughs> and, like, they'll have a $100 million payroll or $110 million payroll due to raises and ARB for the guys they keep. And the team might not win a bunch of games, but they'll be somewhat compelling with their 75, 77 wins and anything they get above that's going to be considered a bonus. And that'll be kind of like the reset that also happens when the Bally's money is sort of in flux. Um, it's all, they're, all, they're getting paid on the Bally's front. Like, nothing stopped there, but with just the uncertainty. Like, I think there is a, there is a parachute pull that could happen if the season goes bad that the front office and the, the ownership group has sort of kind of kept in there as a skeleton key of, like, let's if this thing goes off the rails, here's what we do. And Cardinals fans will hate it, but I'm telling you, there will still be like a bunch of young players that you go, I love Victor Scott. I love Nolan Gorman. You know, I love uh, Jordan Walker. I love Mason Wynn. Like, I love Yvonne Herrera, and Herrera looked good yesterday, too. Pitching would be a question if that happened, but uh, it's a question now. So, I thought at the time bringing in Romero was a move, like putting Crawford on the bench, like uh, give him reps moment. And that's fine, Einstein, but I'm saying you can't almost afford to do a give him reps moment if you're thinking about the long term of this series and how much beat the Dodgers matters, I think it's like I, when I'm offering this criticism, it's not like, oh, he's dumb. Like, I'm not, I, I don't know. I view it's not always black and white. I think that's the interesting element of this discussion. It's like, I understand why he did it. Like, you're in the second game, you want to get your guys in, get them, get them integrated into the season. But also, there may be some things that happen when you have eight games in eight days that you might need that guy the next day or two, and you don't want to potentially risk not having a guy when you really need him because of a just get him work sort of thing. And it's always easier in hindsight because you don't know what's going to happen Saturday. They might not have even played the game Saturday. They they might not have known there was going to be a rain delay if they did play the game Saturday. They might not have known that the game was going to be competitive and they'd be on the upside and need to use some of their leverage guys. Like, you can't predict that ahead of time. And so it's easier to, to criticize a manager than to say right in the moment whether something's right or wrong. Um, and, and a lot more of the critical stuff happens than, than the other part. So that's just a reality of it too. But yeah, you're right. Like if they thought, Hey, give him reps, maybe that was the thought. Eh, can you afford to do that? If you, in your mind, do not trust Ryan Fernandez to have reps, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, Mariposa wants someone to be benched or bat ninth, but I'm not sure exactly who it was because the whole thing kind of jumped on me. Um, Arenado. Yeah, no, I don't think you're going to bench him or bat him ninth, but he they do need to have him pull out of it. He's making like 35 mil, and he's got to be one of your best players or you're not going to have a great team. Like he, like, he wears it when things don't go well because he really wants to win, and he, you know, him wearing it is part of the process because he's got to be great or this team will not be. Like, he's a really important part of this team. Uh, Justin says the fact is the Cardinals might – uh, new hitting coach if they keep striking out 43 Ks in four games. Yeah, we talked about that. It's not what you want. Four games and we looked so much better the last two. That's why Kenneth says it's all okay. Cardinals hitters are not disciplined to the plate. Chase of bad pitches from two stop. Uh, looking forward to tomorrow. K Gibb versus the knuckleballer Matt Waldron. MLB the show legend. I need to be playing the show. I have such FOMO because of the fact that I'm not playing it right now. 
Um, and it's Gibby, by the way. I will be Gibbying you all into submission tomorrow. Uh, miss me with that K-Gib crap. Uh, let's see if Gibby can shove. And I know I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I think it's kind of fun at this point because everybody got so mad about what I said about the Gibby, and so I'm going to stick with it. The Grave of Einstein. Listen, man, I just spent like 60 bucks on a plushie imported from Japan. $5 to talk about Dusty Blake kissing people is a drop in the bucket. Grave of Einstein, I will take your money for the silly chat revenues. I will absolutely do that. Uh, it helps me to not be doing these for free, so respect. Also, there's like some buttons up here where I could click insert ad. I could show everybody an ad at the same time. I'm not going to do that tonight because this is the first live stream back and I want to piss people off. In the future, if I find out that this didn't make me any money, because I make a little bit of money when I do these videos um, on the podcast side, not the live stream. I'm talking about the daily videos or the, the audio that I put a picture with, and that's the podcast. Um, and then if I find out that this one just like screwed me and I talked for an hour and a half and I made even less than I do when I talk for 30 minutes on other nights, um, I probably will have to say, all right, let's take a quick moment and I'll enjoy an ad together for the future, just something to keep in mind next time. I won't do it to you tonight because I, I, re I really hate to do stuff like that, but I also am trying to build this up as, as sort of part of my branding and, and it hopefully will be worthwhile um, to make some money on. Uh, cool Dude says, we have berated, while we have berated the Cards pin, let's talk about the Dodgers being just as shorthanded and mowing down the Cardinal hitters later in the game. Yeah, Daniel Hudson was pretty freaking good, right? The ninth inning was not even like a thing tonight and they didn't have their top relievers. Evan Phillips had been used up already earlier in the series and so there you go oh foster the person from the top rope didn't know you could stream from a fax machine um yeah my laptop is a lenova yoga like mid price 500 bucks is all i spent on it like three or four years ago and let me tell you that's not the webcam that that i should be streaming with nor the processor so um i want to upgrade this year i really do but i also want to buy a ps5 so that i can play the show so it's a lot of decisions Let's, we're just going to keep doing these live streams, and maybe if, if we can pop off on YouTube a little bit, I'll we'll have a little more money to play with to, to get us a better uh, fax machine. But that's a funny joke. I'll always, hey, look, I'll always give credit when I'm I'm getting ribbed and, and made fun of uh, because I use it. I could put you in a timeout, though. YouTube, I was going to like your comment, and then it said, do you want to put this user in a timeout? No, I don't. I don't want to do that, but that would be funny if I did. Um and by the way, yeah, subscribe. If you see the commenters and you're not one of them, hit the subscribe button. That will allow you to comment. I have it set to any duration. So once you subscribe, you can comment in, in the chat. I just don't want to, if you're watching these already, you want to be subscribed. So like, just do me a favor and do that. That's the whole reason I set the chat up that way. Uh, Dodgers, nine homers, Cardinals, one. Good point, GB. Good point, man. Um, Victor is showing great potential. Yeah, the Cardinals need power. You know, like, they just need some power. They need to be able to hit a little better. They need to be able to, like, other teams do it. Why does it feel like pulling teeth to get the Cardinals to a spot where the offense is kind of clicking on all cylinders? We'll see, man. Steven, uh, welcome to the chat. Pitching problems are persisting. Depth my ass. But I'm so disappointed in the offense. Terrible plate approaches, K's galore, lack of situational hitting. Not much to enjoy beyond VS2. Yep. It's the offense, man. It is the offense. It needs to be top, maybe top five is asking a lot. They might not even be, like, top 25 right now. It's the offense, though. You have to be able to have a top, at least top 10 offense, consistently putting up four or five runs a night because you know that the staff that you build on the pitching side is going to give up three, four, five runs a night. That's the way you were designed. It's just what it is. Gorman batting third, nine Ks and 17 ABs. Uh, yeah, everybody's striking out, so I don't want to pick on one guy in particular. Um, the one guy, if I was going to pick on one guy, I would let, I'd be like, Donovan, the looking Ks are, bit, uh, I'm not really sure what's going on there. But I think he's also in a spot where he's definitely struggling a little bit um, to kind of find himself is really what it is. Um, Eric, with a really kind uh, super chat, you didn't have to do me like that, Eric, but I really appreciate that, brother. Um, I took away more positives from the weekends than negatives. Matt's was encouraging, everything else will follow. There are positives to take. And Eric, I really do appreciate that, brother. That was kind of you. Um, there are positives to take from this weekend. There absolutely are. Victor's one of them. I'd say Lance Lynn ends up being one of them. I was a little frustrated watching Lynn, Lynn's two first innings when it's like almost a magnet because his fastball has so much movement on it. It's almost like a magnet to the corners of the zone. You, you see that white box on your screen? And it's like, how does he magnetize it to an inch off the plate every time? Um, but when he is sharp, man, he he's in, in the mojo that he brings. Like, Lance Lynn's going to be a positive. I take away positive from what he did. Um, Michaelis, I think, is going to get better when he's not facing a team of just slugging lefties. 
Um, so I think he improves. I think there were positives to take from Thompson, but it could have been very difficult to see them in a moment where you're going, yeah, uh, you gave up three home runs. So, like, and, and Sonny Gray hasn't pitched yet, right? He's supposed to be the guy that, you know, completely changes the dynamic of this entire thing. So, very much appreciate you, Eric, once again, man. You're the, you're the best. But I also can kind of see his point. It would have felt so much different, though, right, if this was a case where the Cardinals are 2-2. Two and two. If they're 2-2, two and two, nobody in the comments would go, oh, Eric, what are you talking about taking away the positives, which I'm not saying anybody said that I haven't seen. Everybody would go, you know what? Yeah, they kind of they kind of went in there and they played two bad games and then they stole the, the, the other games and they're tied. They got the same record as the Dodgers. That's the margin that happened tonight. That's why it was so disappointing to see them drop it the way they did. But that does tell you that there must be some positives to be discussed because if there weren't, they wouldn't be in the spot that they're in where they're right on the cusp in a, in a series where it could have easily been a split. And nobody should be celebrating a split, but against the Dodgers... I, I kind of take that back. You could have, you would have celebrated a split. The Dodgers are going to win a lot of games. They're going to make a lot of teams this year look like the Cardinals looked on Thursday and Friday night. It is just the reality of the situation. But on the other side of it, you you, you don't want to be going, well, you almost got two and two. Let's throw a party because you did go 71 and 91 last year, and people were pretty upset about the way that that went, understandably so. Uh, once again, Eric, you're the man. I want to, I want to shout you out one more time. Um, where was I though? I, I got right to Eric's comment. And so I want to make sure, okay, here we go. We're talking about Gorman struggling and, and mentioned that he's been struggling, um, hitting better than Arenado. Arenado needs to bat ninth. Yeah. Like some of your best players got to be your best players. And if we're arguing which Nolan gets to hit ninth instead, and, and they're normally your number three and number four guys, that's going to be problematic for uh, the productivity of the team. Aaron says, um, my question comes from a place of someone who has always thought they should have stuck with developing him as a starter instead of rushing him to MLB. I think those guys were on a side quest because I don't know what they were talking about. Um, so I apologize there. Um, maybe Libertor. Maybe y'all were talking Libby. Um, or who'd they rush to MLB? Let's see if I can figure this out. They were rushing... Jordan Hicks. Yeah, Aaron, here was the question. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, if I miss a comment, don't don't be shy. Like, send it again later. If it's, if, if like, because y'all can see where I am in the comments, too, if you scroll up. And then if I zoom past it, and clearly I'm not going to get to your question, ask it again. And then say, hey, dummy, I, I already asked this, but you didn't talk about it. Aaron says, putting this on again, how many good starts from Jordan Hicks before he gets added to the Mount Rushmore of pitchers that got away from Mo? Yeah, I look, all I've done so far, I tweeted out the stat line for Hicks. I tweeted it out for Jack Flaherty today, who went six, gave up one, struck out seven, I believe. I'm just tweeting that out. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that this is like, oh, look at what the Cardinals did wrong. Like people are saying, ah, oh, you're baiting people, you know, that's kind of kind of low. I do think though it's an interesting conversation. Flaherty, not as much, because Flaherty was on this team last year. He didn't perform very well consistently. The stuff was always there. I think he is a classic case of needed a change of scenery, and the Tigers are going to get the most out of him. It's going to piss you guys off, but Flaherty absolutely has talent. If he's healthy, he's going to be good. Jordan Hicks is interesting because the Cardinals could have had him be a starter. They saw 105 and said, he's a closer. We just need him too badly in this role. And I do think that's a case where you can point to the development and say, yep, it didn't help his development long term. Um, it's obviously still in there. If he's able to thrive as a starter this year with the Giants, it's going to be interesting. But always with the Cardinals, like when they would give him an opportunity, it might have been haphazard. It might have been kind of on a whim, and that's maybe why it didn't work out as well for him starting in St. Louis. But, man, the efficiency was tough. When he's throwing 20, 25 pitch innings all the time, which he was doing in the bullpen, and then in starts he would do it too, so he couldn't get very deep it would be understandable to go, well, that's not sustainable for a starter. Does he have a good third and fourth pitch, or is it just kind of the, the fastball slider, you know, sinker slider that you're going to see from him? What's it going to look like for Jordan Hicks over five, six innings? What's it going to look like third time through? Reality is the Cardinals didn't have the patience to find that out, and that's been the case with a lot of different guys over the years. Helsley's, you know, he was a closer in the minors. He threw 100. We never talked about it again. He's a reliever. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I do think it's – when you look at the Cardinals and their lack of dynamic arms to put in the rotation over the years, develop them and say like, oh, we've got a guy who's throwing, you know, mid to upper 90s and has nasty stuff. It's normally not those guys for the Cardinals that get into the rotation. It's like the Dakota Hudson's who 
Yeah, he's not super nasty, but he's he's solid, dependable. He's going to throw strikes, and, and when he doesn't, he's going to walk a bunch of guys and get double plays. Like, that was the archetype of the Cardinals starters that were actually getting the opportunities because the other ones were already in the damn bullpen. And, like, that is something developmentally that I think the organization needs to consider. Um, and and I will be watching to see what Hicks does. I'm more interested to see what Hicks does than, than uh, Jack this year because I think I know what Jack's going to do if he's healthy. Hicks, I don't know for sure. I think there's very much a possibility that it that it does go that way, but I'll be very interested to see kind of kind of how that shakes out. Very much so. Um, so I like that comment. Thank you, Aaron, for putting it back up there too. Uh, another sip of water. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it in the voice after 70 minutes. Icto, welcome to the chat. It says Donovan's a hair late right now on everything, but I've seen enough of him to know that he'll be a menace in a few games. I agree with that. Is Eckstein available for the leadoff hitter? Probably not. Healthy bullpen, top 10 easily, according to Eric. Um, yeah, you're missing Keenan. You're missing Riley, which I think you will continue to be missing Riley. That's a tough one. Um, what do they call it? The, the the flexor tendon or whatever they said on the forearm. Forearms connected to the elbow. Like, I'm a little worried about Riley, but we'll get the info on the MRI and stuff with him. Justin asking my thoughts on the team batting with uh, 43 Ks in four games. Like, yeah, I don't have thoughts on it other than, like, we've basically acknowledged that it's been rough and that this team has not looked good plate discipline-wise. So it needs to change. That's not the marking of a team that's going to be a top-five lineup or a top-ten lineup, and uh, if it continues, it's probably going to be a long year. Uh, I'm not thinking they'll go back to Jockety. Jake says, I'm good, bro. That's good. I'm glad I'm still up. Scott impressed to stop, which I think is right. Addition of Gray will be a domino effect. Yeah, they, he's a tone setter, and and they need to get him back ASAP. Joshua, what's up, my brother? Uh, dang, just now jumping in. Honestly, this series felt like an extension of spring. Pitch limits, days off for young guys, careful bullpen usage. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Last night, it was Wynn, Walker, and Contreras where they said, ah, we want to honor the off day. That's weird. I don't think you need to honor the off day for a 22-year-old Mason Wynn. I do think it would have been better to have him play shortstop for the end of that game instead of Brandon Crawford. Um, I understand why they didn't make the move. I think it's kind of a minor quibble. But it's weird. It's a little bit weird to say after two games they need the off day. Just me. And, and, and like, when I criticize, I don't want people to go, ah, see, Brendan hates Ollie. No, I think Ollie's a sharp guy. I think he's a good manager. A lot of Cardinals fans disagree with me on that. But I do think also there will be times where, like, I, I if I have a minor quibble, I'll share it. It doesn't mean that it's something I put on my gravestone. Um, but, yeah, I think it, the minor quibble for me is, yeah, I, I don't really understand the off days thing that it was so mandatory for those guys, right? Like you couldn't use them. It's okay. I, I, I don't know. Just me. Trevor wants to see the team stay above water until gray returns. That'd be nice. Rich, the bottom half of the starting rotation, bottom half. Oh, it's a bottom half rotation, bottom half bullpen. It might be, it might be. And if it is, that's all the more reason that the offense has to be great. And if they're not great, that's all the more reason that you could be out of the playoffs again if it ends up sustaining as a not great offense. Two stop thinks that Donnie is not a leadoff hitter. And that's not something I really totally agree with. And by the way, tonight on the, the, the live stream, it's just me, just my face talking. Um, I on, on my broadcast software, I'm hoping to do kind of what I did last year and be able to learn how to seamlessly pull up some stuff. Like right here, I'm looking at... Um, I'm not going to do it midstream because it'll look bad, but I'm looking at Brandon Donovan's stats because I wanted to talk about his on-base percentage. He was a 365 on base last year and 395 as a rookie. Um, he's a career 378, even after the struggles a little bit this year. That is a leadoff man to me. Yeah, I think he absolutely is a leadoff man. He just has to, to look a little better than he's been looking. Uh, Garrett, really encouraged to see Matt's do so well. He was painting 96, sinkers on the edges, had Shohei looking like a fool a couple times. Yeah, that was good to see against Shohei. Lefty-lefty matchup. I'd like to see that. And Lynn basically went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Yamamoto. Very similar lines, even if they got there differently. He gets better when the pressure's on. We need everybody else to be like that. Right now, almost everybody looks scared at the plate. Good comments there, Garrett. Appreciate you, man. Um, yeah, I, I think all that was pretty much in line. And Lance Lynn, if you didn't see the, uh, the comment, it wasn't on the video. I don't think Bally was tweeting that one out but was asked about kind of navigating the first inning after the bases loaded with nobody out. And he said, well, figured they're already loaded, so F it. Didn't say F, said the other thing. Uh, just let it rip. So that was kind of the, the Lance Lynn energy that I think this Cardinals team certainly could use. Graham, hello. How are we doing? 
They need Gibby. <laughs> Aaron said they need Gibson to go six plus tomorrow. And I said, ah, they need Gibby. I'll keep calling him Gibby. Yeah, they do need six plus from Gibson tomorrow. But they will have a little bit more on the uh on the uh the bullpen because of the guys who didn't pitch tonight. Everybody talking about MLB the show. PCI, grandpa. <laughs> yeah, I call it API. Yeah, it's PCI. Um, I need it. I need a PS5. <laughs> I need it. Yeah, PCI. I miss it. Kenneth says before today's game, the Cardinals had the worst lineup in baseball with a 15 weighted runs created plus. I'll see if they updated. Yeah, well, I bet it went up a little bit, right? They had some hits today. Austin, hello. Welcome to the stream. And I think we have some new viewers in. Hit subscribe on the channel. You're able to comment right away once you hit subscribe. That's the only the only barrier to entry is a free subscription to the YouTube channel. And I do Cardinals podcasts like every day all year. So not all year, but throughout the season, I'll be doing them hopefully five plus times a week. So you want to be subscribed anyway. Costs you nothing um, unless you wanted to. Unless you wanted to. All right. <laughs> that was my best Theo Vaughn impersonation. Okay. I think it's simply due to small sample size, but dang, that's abysmal. Talking about the way to runs created plus of 15. Yeah, it's not great. Austin is thankful the Cardinals blew it. If they managed to leave LA with a split, would have given them too much credibility. I think that's a little backwards. Like, if you're a Cardinal fan, don't root against your team. I think they still have a chance to be decent this year. Um, so you want to you pick up every win that you can. Why is there a guy in the bullpen not ready to pitch and taking up a spot? Are we? Why are we still stretching out? Well, with Matt's stretching out because he was behind, I don't know if it was injury or what it was. They were trying to keep him healthy. He ended up behind the schedule as a result, um, and it cost him a little bit today. It's not that Fernandez isn't ready to pitch. It's that all he hasn't used him. Uh, to my knowledge, he's ready. Um, they did play short with Riley O'Brien, Riley O'Brien for a couple of days, though. He pitched on opening day. And then was dealing with it, and they took until Sunday morning to IL him. That's a little rough. Yachty is a disciple of Day Duncan. See if he's interested in coaching pitching. Um, he knows Duncan's system. Uh, one second, I'm going to sneeze here. Oh, that was more of a cough. Ooh, I think I turned the volume down, so you didn't hear it. You saw it, though. Yuck. Um, yeah, Yachty didn't even show up to spring training, and he was supposed to be an advisor. So, I don't know. Like, People who are worried about the Ollie extension, it's just money. It's just DeWitt's money, and, and they, they needed to back the manager, I think, unless they had a plan to kind of usher him out. <laughs> and I don't think they do. I think they like Ollie. I know you all don't like that, but I think he's good. I, I think someday I'll get to have um, the vindication on that, and he'll look good when they win again. But uh, for now, you know, if they're losing, he won't look good. But anyway, the idea that Yachty, man, it should be a coach or should be whatever, like he, he could have showed up to spring, and he didn't. I don't know what to tell you. And Trevor's saying the same thing. I know it's early, but damn, this looks and feels like last season. See, Ramirez, you're right, my man. A little bit it does. This series did. But you did face the team that's probably favored to win the World Series if you went to a jurisdiction of legality. Graham asking if we see Mosaic and the Cardinals mutually part ways before his contract year in 2025. I say no, but I certainly could see him stepping into an advisor role, just like a whatever, and giving the reins to somebody else. If this year goes badly... That's part of the trade Goldie or just don't re-sign Goldie, trade Arenado before this, the next season. Don't re-sign Lynn. Don't re-sign Gibson. Don't replace them with anybody of, of super high dollar value and uh, maybe have somebody else like Hein Bloom take over. That, I think, could all happen. And Mo steps aside. I don't think he, you know, it's it's a mutual parting of, not even parting of ways. It's just like stepping into a more, uh, you know, anterior role, whatever you call it, background role. I think he could possibly do that. If this season goes badly, it's like, look, what's left to do? It's going to be a bit of a retool anyway. Um, let somebody else who's going to be around long-term handle it. I could see that, Graham. I, I think it's possible. Um, we're kind of winding down the stream here. I want to cut it off around 90 minutes. So I see uh, we're, we're losing some viewers, which is fine. See if we can get it to Mark McGuire 70 likes, though, before we get out of here. Um, Garrett mentioning Yachty, not really interested in doing anything right now, it seems, which is fine if he wants to do his thing. He's earned it. He's done enough for a long, long time. It's just kind of weird, the the, the little do -si do dance of, is he going to be a coach? No, not quite, but he's an advisor, and he'll come to spring, but not really. It's kind of weird, um, but it's minor. It is what it is. Mike says we can analyze this thing to high heaven. That's fair, but also fair to simplify it and say the pitching staff is more of a liability than an asset. And I look, analyzing to high heaven is what I'm going to do. It's, it's my job all season, so that's what I'm going to do, but... Yeah, right now we want to see more from the pitching. But to me, I'm not so worried about the pitching as I am the offense from the first series. i got to be honest with you. Starting pitching wasn't superb, but it did enough against what I knew was going to be a tough assignment in the Dodgers. 
bullpen, too high of an ERA, too many guys that kind of gave gave pitches away. But I, 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 I still think all in all, not too dissimilar to what I would have expected the, the, the pitching staff to do against the Dodgers. The hitting's got to be better, though. Dodgers have good pitchers, so it's tough to hit against them, but we're not going to do this thing of saying, oh, it's good, so you you know you can't perform against the team. No, you got to beat the good teams, too. Ray says Donnie looks pretty bad both spring and now these four games. Yep, I think he'll come around, though, but it, it does. It doesn't quite look like he's got his timing and everything down the way he wants to. Um, something that concerns Ray is a lot of the regulars had poor springs, and now they've started off poor. Well, Goldie had one of the worst springs on the team, and he's got like a, the highest OPS now. So I do think let's wait another week or so, and then we'll really be able to say, all right, who's actually kind of really struggling hard offensively and who kind of was able to work their way out of it quickly um, after after sort of having that that rough start. I think that'll be something that that is right to sort of wait a little bit more on. But you're right. Like, if we're talking about it through four games, it's been bad. There's no way to couch it otherwise. Mariposa, the whole reason for spring, uh, this is mismanagement by either Ollie or Mo. Figure out who made the call, and there is your issue. Um, I don't know if that's referring to Fernandez or Mats or what it is, but again, like, if a player is physically behind, you, you, you know, a guy who's also been off injured and you're trying to keep him healthy... Having him at 80 pitches today was what it was. Like, I don't think that's something to get too upset about, but I understand the frustration because it always does feel like it's something with the Cardinals and and, and also with Matt's at times. So I'm not trying to rip him. He pitched well tonight. O'Neal with another homer. Who's shocked by that? He's going to hit 30 plus. He is going to hit 30 plus. Tyler O'Neill is going to hit 30 plus, but I said that in, in January or whenever he was traded. Like, it's just what it's going to be. Mike, mind commenting on the possibility of breaking up the love affair between Bill and Moe the chances he gets fired, the none. He's not going to get fired. But like I said, if this season goes bad, I think it'll be all best for all involved to say, hey, Mo is stepping into a whatever role. Here comes Heim Bloom. He's going to, you know, start this retool, and we're going to we're going to take things in a more updated direction. Like that's going to be the the way it's the way it's phrased. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen. That's not me reporting that. I just am kind of looking at the tea leaves and going, yeah, I could see it. And I could if that if that ends up being what it looks like, we're going to see is is a another losing year. Once we get a little deeper in, I'll talk more about like my theories behind that kind of stuff. But for now, you know, that's kind of negative talk. So we'll we'll kind of keep it to a minimum. But that's my thought, Mike. No, Bill's not going to fire Mo, but his contract is up at 2025. And somebody else will be running this team in 2026. That's, that is reporting. Like, Mo's said it. He's stepping away after 2025. Do something different. That's basically been uh, been confirmed. So... Austin said, lost a lot of respect for Mo watching him at winter warm-up. He couldn't care less about being there. Watched him roll his eyes at a number of people and just generally look annoyed. I don't know if I really remember that, but you'd have to kind of show me specifically what you were talking about. But I don't know. It's been a tough year probably to to run the team and have it not go well. So, you know, tensions are high. I think that's probably true. Cards hit the fewest home runs of all 30 teams this spring and 32 less than the Cubs and Pirates with the 17 that they hit. Now only one homer after four games, tying with the Twins for the fewest in the league. Yeah. They're going to need to hit some homers. No doubt about that. But they can't sell out for homers because that's how you have bad play discipline and 43 strikeouts in four games. If it ain't one thing, it's the gosh darn other. That's kind of the way it's been. Trent, I'm going to try to to run through some of the people who I have not seen comment and then get out of here pretty soon. Um, First-time watcher, lifetime Cardinal fan. Show some good signs tonight. You just couldn't get the job done. It's the first series of the season. No need for alarm. Trent, thanks, man. I hope you subscribed. I guess you did if you commented, so appreciate you. Um, Eric says, respect is earned. Uh, I said that I think Mo respects fans. He's never seen evidence of that. Yeah, I mean, I can understand. Like, I I spent five minutes talking about the frustration uh, that fans rightfully felt about the way they were sort of treated last year. And so I'm I'm not just trying to, to end it on, well, he respects fans and then, you know, ignore everything I had said previously. I, I talked through why I thought they could have handled last year better, and, and Mo is at the top of the list of those who could have done so. Joe, only meaningful thing to be taken away from this game is all he still makes poor choices with the bullpen. King with the game on the line, come on. Otherwise, small sample size theater. Uh, Joe, I disagree with you wholeheartedly, but I talked a long time at the beginning of this stream exactly about the reasoning behind that. Um, they didn't have a lot of guys available tonight. So I, I I do not think John King was a terrible move. I could have said go with Helsley in the eighth, but then it would have been King for the ninth, and y'all would have been pissed if that didn't go the right way. I think if anything, and I again, I talked for a long, long time at the beginning, so when you go back tomorrow, you can watch the replay of the stream, the very beginning of it. I'll probably even like kind of clip that portion into its own YouTube video and post it on the channel for those who just want that. Um, 
there were decisions made on Friday and, and Thursday with guys like Ryan Fernandez not pitching and Geo pitching and JoJo pitching that then suddenly they're not available on Sunday when you really need them in a game that you could actually win, and instead you kind of burned them in a game you, you honestly aren't going to win very often statistically because you have a pretty big deficit. Like, that's where I think Ollie could have done something different. The King thing is a minor, a more minor quibble. I know it was the moment that they lost the game, but there are also a lot of things that went into that, and a lot of guys not available. Libby not available, JoJo not available, but why weren't certain guys available? Why wasn't Geo available? That was something else that, you know, it happened earlier in the series. So I think you could critique the bullpen management a little bit, but I would also say it's specific to, like, how you got to this point, not just say, oh, I don't like, what's his name? John King. Um, Mike, thanks, brother. I appreciate the super. Um, that's a cool guy. Is that a fruit? Uh, a pair of some sort? I'm trying to watch what that is. He's dancing. Um, I'm celebrating your first super on a live stream. So I feel really honored, Mike, that I am the first person that you have super liked on a stream. Really appreciate that, guys. You guys are great for that. Um, Mike says, easy to respect the fans when times are good. One's true colors show when times are bad. Mo showed his true colors last year. Mike, I I hear you, man. Like That, I think, is a take that a lot of Cardinals fans have, and it is incumbent upon Mo to sort of put on that, that face this year of, like, I get where Cardinals fans are coming from. I'm not going to demean sort of the criticisms of this team. I'm going to have to embrace and own them. That's a tough thing. And for a guy that's never really had to do that because this Cardinal team has been good under his leadership for a long, long time, Mike makes a great point. It, the going get tough, man. Do the tough get going. That's what we're going to have to find out from Mo and Co. Um, if this season is kind of like a middle of the pack, take some criticism, you know, take your medicine a little bit, but, hey, make the moves that can get this thing over the top. That's going to be interesting. But, yeah, treatment of fans is another element of that. I think that's fair. Moy, I'm just here to say hi, and I'm here to manifest Packy's comeback of all comebacks. Just some Sox fan who follows the cards. Thanks, Moy. Appreciate you for being here. Yeah, Packy didn't get too uh, long of a look this spring. He wasn't on the 40-man, obviously, and he was ushered out of camp pretty early. But um, we'll see how he does in the minors, man. I hope I hope to see Packy again. Brian says, I love the live stream, but I got to work tomorrow. Need sleep. Peace out. Um, by the way, I will end up posting the audio of this entire thing on Spotify, too. So if you if you just want to listen to it on the way to work, whatever, um, it's going to be a long one, longer than a lot of uh, my, my typical videos because the lives, I'm trying to answer y'all's comments. That's the main thing about the lives. But we end up talking about all the topics I would have wanted to get to anyway. So it works out. Uh, but Brian, appreciate you so much, man, for, for watching. Ray, what Cardinals players from the series would be starters on the Dodgers? Any of them? Dodgers typically have better players at about every spot. Let's not read much into this series. Yeah, that's fair. I don't have a lot of answers for who would who would be starters on the Dodgers. Like, it would probably be Arenado, but not the way he played this weekend, right? Goldie, maybe over at first. No, Freeman. Yeah, I get it. I I completely understand where you're coming from. Wild the outside perspective. Uh, thought I see a lot of parallels between the Sox and the Cardinals. Mid-off season decisions, with the only difference is being that the Sox are a big market team acting like they're not. Yep, and that was the whole Heim Bloom thing, by the way. Like, ownership, John Fisher, not John Fisher. Um, what's the the Red Sox ownership name. I know people are... John Henry. Yeah, I knew it was a John something. Fisher is Oakland. Um, yeah, man, the the whole deal with that where I think Heim Bloom got a raw deal there. Like, people say, well, why would you want Heim Bloom? He, he flamed out in Boston. I think they basically took him and said, hey, you basically did something with nothing in that low payroll that you had in, in Tampa. So can you do that for us? Because we want to slash payroll. And oh, and can you trade Mookie Betts? <laughs> it's like, wait, what? So, like, he he basically had to make the deal of Mookie Betts trade because they weren't going to give him the money that he would, would be owed on an extension. And that looked really bad. And then they sort of kicked him out a couple of years later, even though I think they made it an impossible situation for him to uh, succeed under. So that's kind of my thought. Um, Cardinals are a big market team purely because of the fan devotion being so much higher than most teams. St. Louis has been losing population for decades, and yet they still sell out games constantly. Yeah, I, I don't want to hear about the market size, man. Cardinals fans are... A, a different breed and and build a wit and, and ownership group and front office they'll benefit from the the passion and support that y'all that y'all give to the Cardinals so I agree not a big market necessarily if you're just counting population of the of the the metro but it's different Cardinals fans are different and so they do get that revenue stream as a result Colton I see uh Colton S why does Arnado look so lost is it just early season struggles or should we be legitimately concerned that is going to be a question that we track for the days to come um, I think a little bit of both. I think it's early season struggles. He's always been a guy that starts slow, but also does he ever get back to the peak that he once had? Maybe not. Maybe not without a change of scenery, and that would be a hard pill to swallow if you're a Cardinal fan. 
A um, little bit of a stupid question, Trent says. Can you tell me when Lars, Tommy, Carlson, and Sonny will be back? Thank you for subscribing, Trent. Appreciate you, brother. Um, I know that there were some updates on some of these guys over the weekend. And so anything that I say might not be the most substantive unless I look it up. Um, here's Derek Gould. Lars Newpart and Sonny Gray will join AAA Memphis and Indy on uh, this week. Newpart plays Tuesday. Gray starts Wednesday. So there you go. Um, Gray, I think, is eligible to come off on April 9th. And so I think he'll be able to, to pitch on April 9th or 10th. Like he's going to be, barring a setback, ready to go here pretty soon. He might get two. Might get, if he starts Tuesday, or, or Gray starts Wednesday, today's Sunday. April 1st is Monday. The 3rd is Wednesday. So Gray pitches maybe the 8th again in, in AAA. Or maybe they just say the one start and they start him on the 9th and that's it. So um, I think he'll be back here pretty soon. Lars, I think, will be back here pretty soon. He'll beat Tommy back. He'll beat Dylan back. Um, Dylan and Tommy, I think, a little bit more of a delay. We don't really know timeline-wise. I think you see Lars and Sonny both before the 10th of April, if I had to guess. So, like, the next 10 days. Um, and Eric even mentioned that. Thank you, Eric. Yep. Uh, back in the Philly series, according to Gould yesterday. So, certainly possible. Garrett, you're in Austin, Texas, and a generational fan. I lived in the Austin area for a while. My wife and I lived in Georgetown. In 2018 and 19, for a little bit. Love, love, love the area. Um, Garrett, stay for future uh, streams on the channel because I want to talk more about Austin. I need I need people who understand Central Texas is heaven. Love it down there. Um, every road game they go to is a ton of Cardinals fans. They're pretty big. Yeah, that's cool, man. I appreciate you saying that because I wouldn't have known. Shout out Central Texas gang. Shout out to, I was going to name a brand. It's a brand of ice cream that recently came to St. Louis. I'm not going to say the name of it because I want them to pay me money to say it. I got to start thinking in terms of that kind of stuff, right? Like, if you want me to sponsor your product, I even sent them an email. I'm like, guys, I love your product. I would be the best spokesman. Um, but what, what they got just there was free. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Those who know, know. Um, how rich they are means nothing about the ROI on the team. We're still talking about ownership stuff there. That was Eric. Um, who else is ready for Packy to become the Michelangelo on the mound? There you go. Team Packy all the way. Um, since he should have traded him to the angels, we're kind of, we're kind of missing the boat here on some of this stuff. Cause I think people are talking to each other and I can't see what all is going on. You guys have been a great comment and group that, uh, tonight though, Zach Thompson started not great, but he got better confident. He's going to get better. Yeah. I mean, he had some good things happen. Three pitches that were given up for home runs weren't so great, but I also think he did some good things The the, the line score wasn't as good as he pitched perhaps, but also how you pitch is an, is it's indicative when you give up home runs like that, like it all counts. So you do have to keep that all in mind too. Positive Wilson's framing looks better. Um, well, that's good. I haven't really noticed the difference. It's a little bit early for me to like definitively say that, but um, that's fair, Trev. Um, BC says go Dodgers. Wow. We've got some, uh, some Dodgers fans infiltrating. Uh, let's try and get to 80 likes. We're close. Rich wants to know what happened to Riley O'Brien. Yeah, he went on the injured list today. Might have missed it, folks. Um, that's why John King was on the roster to begin with today. If you like missed that news on Sunday morning, you probably were rather confused. Riley O'Brien has been placed on the 15-day IL with a right forearm flexor strain. That is not the good kind. Um, so we don't know the severity yet, though. Evidently happened, I guess, in the, the pitching on Thursday. Maybe he tried to get back into a bullpen session or whatever, and you know whatever the case was. They discovered it and discovered that he needs an MRI and they need to really get a full a full uh, workup on what exactly happened there. So that's not great for Riley. I had high hopes for him. Hopefully he gets back soon. But when it's a, a flexor tendon strain, like it's just those are it's nagging and maybe needs a surgery. I think it ended up being what Miles had a surgery on a couple of years ago. Don't quote me on that because I think there was maybe publicly said one thing, but it was another. I'm not sure. Anyway. Flexor tendon strain, those can always kind of be near the elbow and concern the elbow. And so you like, ah, is it elbow? Is it flexor? Is it going to be a flexor that turns into an elbow? Tommy John, a little bit scary. So um, uh, maybe y'all are still talking packy. That's what it is. BC says, would have been a sweep if Roberts pulls Kelly after hitting Arenado in the catcher's interference. Yeah, that inning was crazy. But uh, the Cardinals ended up really needing it. So that's good. Moy, hopefully the flexor tendon does not end up becoming a TJ thing full out. I was surprised he went down considering he's been durable uh, since he got the TJ in his junior year of high school. Yeah, for Riley, that's bum timing. Just really bum timing. Um, some of the statements in chat are ridiculous. So many ridiculous statements, which are just plain dumb. 
Anyway, the team is 72 and 94 with Chip Carey as the announcer. And I think he's the pro. Come on, Einstein. Don't come after my guy Chip like that. Don't be doing that. Um, all right. Kind of over the 90-minute thing that I said I was going to try to do. So I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom of the comments and only kind of take the ones for the people that I have not seen um, myself read them yet. Corn is back this year. Love it. Anyone saying Ollie is at fault is dead wrong. Yeah, I kind of think that too. Uh, Mike, thanks, man. Uh, love the discussion. Uh, you rock, Mike. Thanks, bro. I appreciate you. Um, 27 pitches for Helsley last night. Don't think he really would have been available tonight. Yeah, probably not, but they said he would have been. So, like, that's the thing. Like, Ryan gets this reputation like, oh, he doesn't care about the team. He doesn't want to. Where did he come up with that? Like, 27 pitches last night, and he was said, yeah, I got an inning in me. Dude wants to win. So, I think Ryan's good people. Uh, Spencer, oh, man, I was literally going to ask when you're going to start filming. I just got so happy when I saw you were live. Yep. It's happening. I am filming this with a potato. I will get better equipment if we continue to make these things pop and happen. It's been a good one tonight. You know, probably not as many views as I would get on a video typically. Um, but at the same time, like, it's it's already, you know, 600-something views, and it's not midnight. Tomorrow morning, maybe people will wake up and watch the replay. That's the hope. Sometimes the, the revenue just doesn't happen the same, but that's fine. I forget revenue today because my guy, uh, my guy Eric, and Mike and, and uh, the Grave of Einstein were very generous tonight. So appreciate you guys. Uh, Ryan C., what's up? Ownership is to blame. Root of all the problems with the Cardinals, not Ollie. Ownership, front office, like it's all tied into one another. And so, you know, what's the the willingness to spend? Like, I, I feel like I, I push back on the notion that, oh, they won't spend on starting pitching. No, no, no. That's not true. They're paying their starting rotation more than, like, 22 other teams this year. Everybody in the rotation has an eight-figure salary for 2024. The problem is they haven't been able to develop pitching. But if you don't have that cheap starter that you get on a, on a minimum salary for a few years before he enters ARP, but he's like your number two, like teams that develop aces get that. The Cardinals have not developed an ace in a long, long time, let alone like just think about developing a starter who like stays and, and deserves a second contract. Like Flaherty, yeah, they developed him, but then he's, he's gone because it was kind of like eh, reaching the end of the line and it wasn't working out that well. When do they develop the ace at like homegrown and they gotta they're like, we gotta resign this guy and keep him forever? Like he's our anchor. You know, it hasn't really happened in a long time. And part of the issue is when you look at the the topic we mentioned earlier with a guy like Jordan Hicks, what are they doing when it comes to guys that throw a hundred or have dynamic stuff if they make them a reliever and then you don't have those guys available to be potential starters? Tink Hentz is the next guy I'm looking at for that. Like they might look at it and go, well, you know, they. I think he's more of a reliever build, or is it now they need this? They need to let this string play out. Can he be a starter because he is dynamic and they need guys like that? What will Cooper Jerpy be? What will Takoa Roby be? Like they need to dynamic to, to develop one of these dynamic starters into major league dynamic starters. VS two has what this team lacks most: speed. That's Ryan. He deserves every chance to start 120 games this year, 120 plus, maybe so. We like him. Uh, Ryan says we need B-Shape on the hot take central twice a week, not just Friday. Um, I would love to love to be on it more. Um, we'll see, man. Maybe if I do a good job, they'll invite, they'll, they'll want to have me more. I don't know. Um, I like mixing it up with those guys. It's going to be a lot of fun, uh, to be able to do that this, this, uh, summer. I mean, I guess this indefinitely, but yeah, Friday's on hot take central five ninety. the fan cam Jansen, Jim, the cat Hayes, Cole Bartimus. We have a lot of fun. So check that out, Friday morning, 7 to 10 a.m. This really is a fun show to do. By the way, if you like my talk, uh, KTGR, I do a radio show in Columbia, Missouri, 4 to 6 p.m. every day, weekdays. Yeah, we talk a lot of Mizzou. I'm wearing the 2020 SEC tournament, uh, basketball tournament T-shirt. It was a canceled tournament. It didn't happen, but I bought the shirt for $5 on, like, Fanatics or something because I thought it would be funny. I'm wearing my state of Missouri Mizzou hat, um, so... Big Mizzou guy, but we talk a lot of Cardinals, too. We're a Cardinals affiliate out there in Columbia. So if you like Cardinals talk, you'll get some of it 4 to 6 p.m. Plug my KTGR show while I'm here. Uh, the cat is a delight. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Brady wants Tink to pan out, and the Cardinals really should want the same thing, too. Is Lance Lynn the best pitcher they've developed since 2010? Maybe. Yeah, and then they didn't give him a second contract, and he was kind of like, what the heck? And then he goes on the, the nomadic journey, and then he comes back. It's interesting. Trent, thank you for what you do. Appreciate it. Keep watching as long as you keep posting. Thanks, man. It's great to have guys like you who uh, who support the content. It's re it really makes it worthwhile to, to see nice comments like that. Thanks, dude. Um, all right. Yeah, I think we'll end it there. 
I think that's about it, man. Unfortunately, Corn thinks uh, I think Stink will be a third starter at best. Don't call him Stink. That, I'm going to say that was a typo. That's not nice. Grave of Einstein, even one of hence Roby Jerpy in the rotation becoming like a one or a two will hit so nice. Yep, that's what they need. That really is what they end up needing. And just think about how different it could look. Because you're all saying, well, they don't spend on pitching. Why didn't they sign Monty? They're paying five guys like 11 plus million dollars. I know that's maybe not a ton of money, and I know it's not long-term commitments, but like they're paying their whole rotation eight figures. They need to develop somebody so that when an opportunity like Jordan Montgomery happens that is unexpected late in, in March and people could sign him for less than they thought, then you can jump on it. But right now it's like they're having to backfill just to sign the guys that they that they need to be their number four and number five starters. Those should be internal. I know we always decry the internal option. Be like, that's lame. Spend money. No, have somebody who is your number, you know, paid like he's your number five, but he's good enough to be your number two. And that's why you, why those teams like the Braves go to the playoffs and win. That's just me. The problem is not the Cardinals' unwillingness to spend. Their payroll is not as high as they said it would be. It was kind of a bait and switch. I think it's only like 185. They said they could go up to 200. Or they said they could go up to what they planned to be able to go up to the previous year, which they didn't spend up to that in 2023 because they sold at the deadline. But that was generally understood to be like 200. We, we can we can mince words on that if we want to. But I look at it and say, dude, and Corn says I did not mean to say stink. Okay, good. I didn't think you did, so I was just making sure. But yes, that's you got to develop these pitchers, and hence Roby Jerpy. I mean, you throw Graceffo into there. McGreevy, again, like they drafted McGreevy. He's not a strikeout guy. He's a very Dakota Hudson-y kind of guy to draft. I'm not trying to belittle the guy. I think he's a good pitcher, and I want to see him succeed. But they need to almost draft for stuff a little bit more. Like Zach Thompson, I feel like, was a good blend of that. He's got stuff. Um, now he's got to use it at the highest level. They traded a Rosarena because they sort of recognized, man, we haven't developed these pitchers. Maybe Libby can be that. Well, he hasn't been, and now he's in the bullpen. Maybe he can be a weapon there, but like, it's not that they won't spend on pitching. It's that they haven't had the luxury to spend on pitching the way Cardinals fans want them to spend on pitching. They're spending on their fourth and fifth starter just to, to keep their head above water instead of having internal options that they can trust to pan out and then aggressively pursuing the Blake Snell moments and the Montgomery moments when they come to fruition late in spring. That's how I view that. Um, just my two cents. All right, hit the subscribe button on your way out of here if you haven't done that already. Um, if you haven't, it probably you weren't able to comment because you have to subscribe to comment uh, with the way that I have it set up. But please do subscribe. Appreciate you guys for sticking with me for damn near two hours. It's an hour 42. Um, so thank you guys. Eric says Libby's too young to give up on him. I think so too. But he could turn into an Andrew Miller type of reliever, and that could end up being pretty good too. Why would you sign a pitcher that gave up a record four straight homers in a playoff inning? I get it. Um, was it? I don't know if that was in the playoffs. Was that in the playoffs that Kyle Gibson gave up four? Um, I don't think it was. Because it was against the Cardinals when it happened. So I don't know about it being a playoff inning. I could be wrong about that, but we'll talk about it tomorrow night potentially. Thank you, GGs. Good night, Eric. The Grave of Einstein, GG. Everybody, appreciate you guys so much. That is going to do it for this edition of B-Shape Daily Live for the first time in 2024. Peace.